If you're not healed, it's not because you don't have enough faith. Uh, and I wanted to stress that because I think that the modern church has kind of beat people over the head, uh, made them feel terrible, made them feel like weak Christians or inferior Christians, uh, if perhaps God didn't end up healing somebody that they were praying for. Uh, and so I wanted to cover that. But tonight I want to cover a different aspect of that uh, topic from John chapter 5. And I want to teach, uh, <coughs> excuse me, tonight on the subject, on the subject, even Jesus didn't heal everybody. Even Jesus didn't heal everybody uh, and so we're going to look in John chapter 5 and we're going to look at verse number 1 to kind of to kind of look at that theme and the Bible reads in verse number 1 uh, and everybody's found it by now Amen. all right and if not it's on the screen behind you there uh, the Bible said after this there was after this after this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up uh, to Jerusalem so as you're reading through the Gospels and one thing that is interesting to me is the way each gospel writer uh, presents the story that he's presenting uh, and sometimes Sometimes they, 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 they have different angles, they have different reasons why they do things. Maybe they're even specifically targeting, targeting a different audience. Uh, yet it's the same story, but that author will choose to use other details. So let's look at John chapter 5, verse number 1. We're going to notice something about John. John often tells his story surrounding the events of the Jewish people. He says in verse number 1, after this there was a feast of the Jews. And so John oftentimes describes his story along uh, with the details of what's happening in the Jewish community. Jesus was a Jewish man, right? The Bible said in John chapter 1, he came to his own. Uh, that's the Jewish people. His own received him not, but to as many as received him. To them gave he the power to become the sons of God. So Jesus, being a Jewish man, goes to the Jewish people. And so it's quite uh, it's quite possible that John's target audience was who? The Jews. The Jews. I mean, it's pretty, it's yeah. probably uh, quite likely that John was targeting the Jews. And so much that when he tells his story, maybe a different gospel writer, Mark, Luke, Matthew, maybe they leave out some of the Jewish yeah. feast dialogue, but John includes it. Now, I think that he does that for uh, the purpose of targeting a specific audience, but I think he also does that because then those feast dates sort of give us a time frame of what is happening in the in the life of Jesus, and uh, did this story take place in the one of the spring feasts, or there was a certain yeah. spring feast, or did yeah. it take place in one of the fall feasts, and so it kind of gives us an idea or a time frame uh, and, uh, but, but so John chapter 5 verse number 1 says uh, after this there was a feast of the Jews so this is the only feast that John references that he doesn't tell us exactly what the feast is right. uh, if you have your Bibles go back with me uh, and I didn't give this one to Kelly so Kelly you can just stay where you're at uh, go back with me to John chapter uh, 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 2 and we're just going to read quickly verse number 3 uh, John chapter 2 I hope I wrote that down correctly we're going to find out uh, I don't think I did. Let's look at John chapter 6, verse 4. And let's try that. Uh, John 6, and verse 4. Amen. Uh, the Bible said, After the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. So, John chapter 6, verse 4, here's John doing again. He references the feast of the Jews, and the feast of the Jews is the, the Passover. Uh, look with me. We're just going to skip through these things. I just want to, this is not the main point, so I'm not going to spend much time here. I just want to note it so the next time you read through the Gospel of John, you can reference it and you can pick up on it too. John chapter 7, verse number 2, John says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand so uh, so now he references the feast of the Passover he references the feast of tabernacles go with me to John chapter 10 verse 22 and we're just flying through this stuff real quickly because this is just a, a small point that I want to make along the way John chapter 10 verse 22 uh, John says and it was at Jerusalem the feast of dedication and it was what winter, winter. so wow. John does use the feast of the Jewish people now those feasts are written up in specific detail in the Old Testament. So if you're familiar with the Old Testament, then you'll know certain feasts happen in spring, certain feasts happen in fall, certain feasts happen near the winter time. Uh, and so that's a way that we can sort of date and follow the life of Jesus to figure out when he's doing something, what time frame it would be. And then if he references a Passover in the early part of John, and then he references another Passover in the, uh, in the middle part of John, and that's kind of telling you that one full year has passed. It's Passover and Passover, right? And so it's a way that John sort of sort of tells his story so that we can understand the time frame of the events. And this and this and that I think is pretty important. What do you think? Right. All right, go back to John chapter five, verse one, uh, and we're going to read that verse again and get off of, of, of that particular point. John chapter five, verse one. 
uh, the, Bible, the Bible reads, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. So this is the one feast that John references that he doesn't give a specific feast for. He just calls it a feast of the Jews. Uh, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now that is the natural, and not only the natural, but it's the commanded responsibility of Jewish men uh, when the feast rolled around, at least there was three, the, three of them, where Jewish men in particular were commanded to go back to Jerusalem for that feast. Now, that's actually why there were so many people gathered at, at Pentecost on the day of Pentecost because that was a feast of the Jews and all those Jews had gathered into Jerusalem to celebrate it and that's when the Holy Spirit was poured out. So uh, so Jesus does what Jewish people Jewish people would do. He goes back to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. Everybody with me? All right, so look at verse number two. Uh, now there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. So at Jerusalem, Jerusalem had a sheep market, and there there was a pool. Now this is not the kind of pool necessarily that we would imagine, a pool that necessarily you would maybe uh, take your children swimming in, or a pool that you would just enjoy a dip in. It had a specific purpose and a specific reason, uh, but it wasn't necessarily for leisure. Uh, and, and there, but there was this pool at Jerusalem near the sheep market, and the Bible reads, in verse number two, which is called in the Hebrew tongue uh, Bethesda, having five porches. So uh, I looked at the meaning of the word Bethesda, and it meant uh, the, uh, the house of outpouring, the house of outpouring. And so it, it, there was this particular pool in Jerusalem, uh, and it was called the Pool of Bethesda. Bethesda meant the house of outpouring, or the place where outpouring happened, uh, and, and it also was surrounded by five porches, or five spots where people could rest, or people could sit, or, or, or people could lay. Uh, and so what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you. You picture this uh, pool, uh, and surrounding this pool was these five porches, and, and thus there's a lot of room for people to gather, isn't there? Right? Uh, so typically, some pools don't even have a, uh, any deck associated with them. They just a pool. We had a pool at one point. We just had a standalone pool, and there was no deck or no porch or nothing for anybody to sit up near the pool. You just had to sit away from it and watch what was going on inside the pool. But in this pool at Bethesda, uh, there was five porches surrounding it. So there's plenty of gathering space. Now let's see what let's see what happens in this story. Let's see who gathers there. Uh, in these in these porches or in these areas where people could gather, uh, lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, of halt, of withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Now, as a general rule, water in pools doesn't move on its own, does it? Right. Now, when we had a pool, we had a circular pool, and when we were when we would play in it, one of the things I like to do was I like to get everybody going in the same direction around the perimeter of the pool, and the faster you could go, the more you could work it, the greater that the, the direction of the pool and the water would carry you, uh, and you could even stop for a minute, and you could just flow while everybody else is still doing some work, uh, and that the, the way, the direction of the water would just carry you in a circle, and it was fun, and maybe you'd hang out to the side, and somebody would come knock you off of the side, right? It was just a fun time, but what I would say this is, if there was nobody in the pool going in a circle, the pool, the water did not move on its own, did it? Uh, right? It's because pool water doesn't, doesn't move on their own. So when people are waiting for the moving of the water, something is going to have to move it. That's right. Whether it be a pump that is hooked up to it that causes the water to circulate, because uh, at least in modern times you have that sort of thing, right. or if it be a, a pool that's fed by a creek that causes the water to move, or whatever the case. But in this case, something supernatural is going to move this water. Right. Exactly. So I want you to notice the, the scene here. There's the pool there's the five porches, I believe is what verse number two called them. Five porches. And on these five porches lay, watch what it said, a great multitude of impotent folk. I looked up the word impotent before I came to, to church tonight. Uh, and it says, it says, the definition said, unable to take effective action. So if, if one is considered impotent, they are unable to take effective, effective action. Uh, the other definitions that were given were helpless or powerless. 
So there was all kinds of sick people. They were gathered on these five porches at the pool, right. but they were helpless to affect their situation. Right. They could not help themselves. They could not heal themselves. They right. couldn't uh, fix themselves. Uh, they could not. They did not have the ability in themselves to affect the situation. But even deeper than that, they not only couldn't heal themselves, but if the truth were known, for the most part, they couldn't even get themselves into the pool. Right. Uh, and if they could, it was going to be a long journey. It was going to be a lengthy process for quite a few of them. But for the most part, they not only could heal themselves, that's a given, but they also could not get themselves mainly into the pool. Now, I want you to see verse number 3. The scripture said in verse number 3, In the east of lay a great multitude. That's a lot of people. A great multitude. So John takes care to tell us that there are many, many sick people gathered on these five porches. And I love, I love the detail. And I love the fact that there are five porches because that provides an opportunity for a great multitude to be gathered there. It's not just one people. It's not one person or two people or three people. It's a great multitude. Right. I'm not sure that I would classify the number of people in church tonight as a great multitude. Right. I, think it's a, I think it's a great number, and I'm very well pleased that you're here. But I would think in the definition of terms, I would not classify us as a great multitude. No. Uh, probably if you go downtown on the 4th of July to the fireworks, uh, when, as long as people still believe it's a good thing to celebrate America's independence. Amen. Right. Uh, but if you do that, there's probably a lot of people gathered down there, and maybe thousand. I don't know. And you could consider that maybe a great multitude. Right. But I guess the point is this. Whatever number a great multitude is, it's a, it's a pretty big number. So then, and, and, what, and what are these people? Who are they? Well, the Bible said that they were impotent, which means they were, help, they were helpless uh, to help themselves, to heal themselves. But also, watch what it says. They were, uh, of, they were blind. They were impotent. Verse number three, they were also blind. Right. Now, picture this. Now, they're all waiting. The Bible already told us for the moving of the water, right? Right. But so, so now I'm on a porch, and I'm, I'm, I'm blind, and I'm waiting for the moving of the water. And when the water moves, we're going to find out it's my job to get into the water. And if I can get in the water before you, uh, who are also helpless, perhaps blind yourself, if I just happen to stumble my way there without hurting myself even more... Okay. I mean, just think about it. Without hurting myself even more. And by the way, there's a time crunch on these people. Yeah. There's a time crunch on what they want to do. Right. They want to get into the water, and they want to get in there first before anybody else gets in there. Right. Which means as soon as I... By the way, a blind man can't see the moving of the water, oh. so he's at a disadvantage already, isn't he? He's got to listen for it. So this, if you really think about this story, in, in many ways, I find this story to be almost a, 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 a very uh, disheartening, almost discouraging, almost sad state of affairs that human people are in. But if you look at the state of human people in general, it is a sad state of affairs that human people are in. Yeah. So the man's but one of some some of the people are blind. So they have to hear the moving of the water, which automatically puts them at a, at a disadvantage. Right. And the angel's gonna come down and actually stir the water. So maybe the angel makes himself known. I don't know, the Bible doesn't say. Maybe the, makes, the angel makes himself known at a hundred feet before he gets to the pool. Right. That means everybody else who has sight, they got a hundred foot advantage on me, don't they? Right. Now that's not necessarily what this, the scripture says, but it could be angels make appearances from time to time. Right. So, but no matter what, when I see the water troubled, uh, I've got an advantage a little bit, maybe a, a split second, and sometimes the seconds matter. Right. Uh, I've got an advantage over the guy that is not blind. Right. But let's see what else, uh, the else the type of people who are there. They said that they are blind, and then they also are halt. And have you ever heard in a movie, maybe they'll say, halt, who goes there? Yeah. Right? Uh, so what does that word halt, halt mean? If I'm walking, excuse me, if I'm walking uh, and somebody says, halt, who goes there? That is an indication to me that I need to stop walking right. and announce who I am. Right. Right? So then perhaps I come over to your house at 2 a.m. this then in the middle of the night, and I'm going to borrow a tool. Uh, and, and I'm going to try to borrow, I'm going to more or less think about my dad. <laughs> and I'm going to try to borrow a tool without waking 
anybody up. And so I'm in the garage and I'm fumbling around at 2 a.m. and I'm trying to find it. So I turn on the light and I'm hoping my car door wasn't too loud. Uh, and, but, but let's just say my dad stumbles out of his house and, and he doesn't know who's in his garage. So he says, Halt! Yeah. <laughs> <Or> stop! <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I gotta go. <laughs> That's my life. Okay. Right. Uh, the click of the shotgun. That's right. That's a universal noise right there. Guess what you do? You're gonna halt. You're gonna stop. You're gonna stop in place. So if I am described as a halt person, I am then described as a person who what? Can't move. Can't walk. So who are the halt? They are crippled people. So now they're crippled, but they got their eyesight. Right. So they got an advantage over the blind guy because they see the water to struggle to to trouble first. Right. But they really don't have much of an advantage over the blind guy because they can't even move, man. They're halted. Right. They're stopped in their tracks. Right. So now I've got around this pool. I've got the blind folk. The, the, man, that's sad. Uh, and I've got halted people, people that are crippled. They can't move. There's some sort of ailment in their body. Uh, and I would almost consider the halt as people who are suddenly stopped. Yeah. Suddenly stop. So, Brother Jason, uh, I wanted to, um, maybe I shouldn't, well, I'm just going to use it. Uh, Brother Jason goes out and he gets in a car accident. Uh, and before I get in a car accident, I have perfect limb, my limbs move. And I get in a car accident and it's real bad. And then I, it's a sudden moment where I'm halted. Let's say the, the car accident cripples me uh, to some degree. Uh, and that is a sudden move. So I went from being able to move to suddenly halting. And now I'm suddenly crippled. I I used to have control over my faculties, but I don't anymore. Right. Halted. But also watch what it says. It says, now there's also people there who are withered. They're withered. Withered. Uh, so I looked up uh, the definition of what that meant, and I did not know this, but there is actually a sickness called uh, the withering sickness. Uh, and it talked about the fact that people who had Withering's disease would, and I don't know that that's necessarily what it's talking about, but it could be, and it likely is, that the people who had Withering's disease would lose control over certain body parts, but they would, instead of losing it like halting, like right now, like quickly, they would lose it slowly over time. Right. So now those people probably have the greatest advantage. Right. Right? Because especially if I if I've lost my if I lose my limbs and my legs and movement suddenly, I can't get into the pool. But if I start to lose it slowly over time, but I still have a little bit of a, a, a little leg power left, then I because I'm losing it slowly, then perhaps I have an advantage over the blind, and perhaps I have an advantage over the halt. And it's my job to, to, to get into the water before they do. By the way, this is might makes right. This is every man for himself. Whoever's the strongest wins. Because, and because of the, and the truth is, uh, this opportunity only comes around one time a year for me to get in this pool uh, and get healed of my infirmity. And we're going to find out that's the, 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 the basis of the story. It only happens one time a year. So it promotes, uh, it really does, if you think about it, it promotes selfishness, doesn't it? Right. Yes. Because if, I'm, if I got a little bit of power and you got no power, if I'm withering, but you're halt. Right. Then maybe I can get in there before you. Right. Not only did they say withering's disease dealt with the body, parts of the body, but they also described, and, and I didn't know this, but they also described the withering's disease as being a, a slow decay of the mind. The slow decay of the mind. I would almost liken it to uh, dementia or uh, Alzheimer's or something like that. Uh, and, and, and so uh, now, 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 if I have Withering's disease of the mind, uh, and I can, and I can, I see, and I see the waters being stirred. The truth is, it may, it may come into my brain that that means I need to get into the pool. Right. But Withering's disease, folks, they sometimes forget things pretty quickly, don't they? Right. And so they may turn around and watch all the blind people and they may turn around and watch the halt and the wither uh, and, and, and all the people around them and they may get distracted because uh, you, you've probably seen that uh, they may get distracted they may forget where they are right between the time that the waters are troubled uh, to the time when it's actually time, uh, the, the, whatever time span it was, between the waters being troubled and when somebody got in, they may have started out with good intentions, yeah, uh -huh. but somewhere along the way their mind was so withered yeah. that they done forgot all about them. They got distracted yeah. by the blind people, tripped yeah. over the whole people. And if you just think about this, this is a sad story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you just really think about it. 
You take a bunch of sick people and you put them all in one spot and you have a competition and you just think about it and you have a competition <laughs> to see which one of them can get into the water for them. Yeah. So it's sad. Right. But not only is it sad, the truth is in some ways it's still an act of the mercy of God because God didn't have to ever trouble the waters and right. God never had to send an angel down and God didn't have to heal anybody. Right. But right. for whatever reason, the Bible said in a certain season he would send an angel down. Let's read that verse 4. For an angel went down, which implies that the angel was first what? Up, right? Right. Yeah. Which implies that God is in control of this angel. Right. Because it was up and seemingly in heaven with God. And God sent it down and commanded to do something. Uh, for an angel went down at a certain season. Now I want you to notice that at a certain season, that the season right. has to be connected to that Jewish feast, whatever it is. Right. From verse number one. Yeah. So, so, so it, it wasn't that, that the angel came down in every season. Right. It wasn't that the angel came down every Friday night. Right. It wasn't that he ever even came down every first Tuesday of the month. Right. It was that he came down at a certain season. Now, I want you to pay attention to that language. A certain season. Just one. Right. So think about this. Right. The angel's under the control of God. Is that right? Yeah. He comes down from heaven. Yeah. That means that God sends him down, not two times, not three times, not four times a year, but one time. Okay. Now, God didn't have to heal anybody, but if you think about it, what is that telling you? That tells you that whoever steps into the pool for the first time, uh, they gets in there first, gets healed. And that, that tells me that everybody else who didn't get there, the wither, the hawk, the blind, whoever it was that managed to stumble into the pool first, everybody else did not get healed. That's right. Right? That's right. So, I would submit to you that even God the Father... Doesn't heal everybody. If right. you think about it, God made a choice. And God's choice was to send an angel down one time a year, not two times a year. Right. Not three times a year, not four times a year. And when God made that choice, God said, the first person who gets in the water gets to be healed. Uh, and that means that that is to the exclusion of all the other people that didn't get in the water, which meant that God had the power, if you just think about it, to heal them all, but chose to only heal the one. Right. Now, I, I would submit to you that God has a choice. Right. We are so humans brain-centered that we expect that God has arranged the universe in so much that we have a choice about everything and He's just got to sit upstairs and open heaven and wait to respond to all of our choices. But He don't have a choice in nothing. And to me, that seems very man-centered. I would submit to you that God has a choice. And actually, God is in charge of the universe, and I am not. Uh, I don't write my own destiny. God is in control. I didn't choose to be born at this time in American history. I think I'd have rather been born in about 1920 when Billy Sunday was blazing the countryside and everybody was getting saved. Hallelujah. I'd, I'd love to meet old Billy Sunday. But God has been born in this generation at this time, and that was God's choice. Right. So God has a choice. Now what was God's choice? God's choice was not to heal everybody, but God's choice was to heal one person. Uh, and I don't know why God would choose to do that, but that's what he chose to do. Verse number four, let's read it. He says, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Uh, whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Right. Now, now let me ask you this question. Did all of these people that were at the pool on the porches waiting for the troubling of the water, did they all have faith? Yeah. They had to have. Yeah. Right? Because they were probably there last year. 
Yeah. When the angel came down and the water was troubled, and they remember, oh, Brother Jason, who was healed of his uh, 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 back problems last year because right. he got into the pool before me. Right. And now I've been walking around with no back problems, and they know that if God did it, then he's going to do it again this year. And every one of them believes in God. Right. They do. If they didn't believe in God, if they didn't have faith in God, if they had no trust in God, they would not be waiting around the pool. Right. But because they do believe God, they're waiting around the pool. Now, isn't this just like humanity? Right. Isn't it just like Christian people? Yeah. You know how many people in my lifetime I have believed God for their healing, and yet they did not get healed. Right. And sometimes we're winding up, scratching our heads, wondering, well, what was it me, Lord? Or should I have prayed more? Should I have fasted more? Maybe I didn't do enough. Maybe I wasn't enough. Maybe I maybe the reason God didn't heal them is because I lost my temper the other night and if I had just been a better Christian. And all of a sudden what happens is people put all this guilt and all this weight and all this burden on themselves wow. and actually preachers put it on them too. Right. Which is what annoys me the most. Right. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, put all this guilt on them right. that they have to live with that said, if I had just prayed one more time, right. God would have healed them. But the truth is, if you pay attention to Scripture and the character of God, even God didn't heal everybody. That's right. right. God could have sent down the angel the next day, too. Yeah. Right? That's God right. made a choice to only send it down once. Now that was the background of what the Father was doing in Israel and Jerusalem at that time. Now John is going to write to us about what Jesus is going to do. Right. And I would submit to you then, we're going to find out that even Jesus doesn't heal everybody. All right, let's look at verse number 5. <coughs> and the Bible says verse number 5. Uh, and a certain man was there, uh, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. That's a long time to be sick, isn't it? A certain man had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Now, if he had an infirmity 30 and 8 years, what do you think the chances are that every certain season, whatever that was, that that man gathered at the pool of Bethesda waiting for the waters to be troubled so he could get in ahead of everybody else? Right? I mean, probably the chances are he's been doing this routine for the last 38 30 years. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's a long time. I mean, could you imagine the sheer uh, letdown? I mean, the sheer anguish it would put in the heart of a human being that when I know I've got one opportunity, man, i got to beat all these blind people and i got to beat the withered and I may even smack that guy out of the way. <laughs> right? I mean, really, this, 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 this thing is, if you just think about human nature, man, it's might makes right. People are going out, for, they're looking out for the number one. Yeah. Right. So he's doing it. Can you imagine the sheer disappointment in your heart when you man, you, you waited 365 days for this one moment, right. and for 38 years somebody right. else beat you into the pool every time. Right. Now you would walk away thinking God is a healer, but you'd also walk away knowing God don't heal everybody. Right. right? right. Now, now the modern church, modern Pentecostalism, in fact, would like to tell you God does heal everybody, but the truth. They're lying. Right. They're lying and they're yeah. liars. Right. That's right. Amen. That's right. Because if the truth were told, there's not probably one preacher that I've ever met that there wasn't a multitude of people that they prayed for their healing and they did not get healed. Right. And yet they still walk away with that theology that God heals everybody. Right. Right? Right. So they yeah. say to me, well, if you'd have just had more faith, you'd have been healed. Uh, and I think to myself, well, everybody at this pool had faith, otherwise they wouldn't have been there anyway, right? right? right. So they all did have faith. Faith, right. is not faith is not some magic ingredient that if you just work it up enough, you could twist God's arm and make him make a choice that he does not want to make. Right. Amen? Yeah. It's not. You can't just work up your faith enough to force God into choosing your way. Sometimes God might say no. And you say, well, God, why? And sometimes the why's never come. But the truth is, even if the why never comes, we still settle on some main facts. God is good. God's word is true. God is benevolent. He's gracious. He's kind. He hears me when I pray. He accepts me through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm redeemed. God is good. I'm his child. I don't know why, but I trust him. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Hallelujah. 
So let's look at this story, I guess. I'm not going to quit talking so much. Verse 5. Uh, and a certain man was there which had him infirmity 30 and 8 years. And Jesus saw him, uh, excuse me, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? Yeah. Now, now, let me ask you this question. Jesus zeroes in on this man, maybe for a lot of reasons, but he says here in verse number six, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. Do you think he's the only one around the pool that's been alone? time in that case? No. 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 Yeah. So I mean, when this story is finally over, I'm going to ask Jesus, why did you make that choice? Right. Right? Yeah. You, well, well you've been there a long time. Well, yeah, but so you have been there. Right. These other people have been there a long time too. Right. That's right. Yeah. So why him? Why did you heal him and not him and her and them? And right. This is really, really where the modern church lives at is we have loved ones who we desperately want to see healed and we pray and we, they, they, they sometimes pass away and they sometimes don't get healed right. and then we're wound up with Jesus. Well, why did you heal them and not them? And we're wound up with all these, 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 these questions. And the truth is sometimes they're just unanswered. Okay. Just unanswered. Yeah. Right? So Jesus asked the man, will thou be made whole? Now, by, by the way, Jesus is about to follow the example of his father. Right. Now, I don't fully understand why God only sent an angel down one time, once a year. But when Jesus shows up to the pool of Bethesda, he's only going to heal one man. Right. And by the time John 5 is out, you can read John 6 and 1. The Bible says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. So what did Jesus do? He stopped in Jerusalem, healed one man, left everybody else sick around the pool, and then moved on and went across the Sea of Galilee. And, and, and it certainly came back to Jerusalem, but it did not necessarily ever come back. The Scripture never records, ever came back to the pool right. and never healed anybody around the pool. Right. Now, so let's look at this, uh, verse number 5, I guess. And a certain man which was there had infirmity 38 years. Jesus said to him, verse number 6, without any hold, the impotent man answered him. So the Bible tells us that he was impotent, which means he was helpless. He had no ability to effect a change in himself. Uh, sir, he says, sir, I have no man. Now, I read that verse, and I thought, man, it's like a lot of, uh, 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 <laughs> like a lot of, uh, <laughs> I have no man. <laughs> so, right. oh, wait on the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Right. Y'all get it later. Uh, but but uh, now, seriously though, he says, I have no man <laughs> uh, to, 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 to help me uh, when the water is troubled. Verse number seven. So what's he telling you? He's telling you he's without any help. He has no friends. He's friendless. He has no help. Because if I had enough help that I could say to all my buddies, here's what I want you to do. I want y'all to go guard the base of the pool right. and make sure anybody gets near it to kick them out of the way. And then I want somebody else to grab me up underneath the armpits yeah. and carry me into that pool and baptize me in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy yeah. Ghost. Right? Okay. Because if I get in there, I get yeah. in here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's right. I mean, you could orchestrate this thing a lot of different ways, right. but this man's testimony was, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. That's why I'm not healed. That's why it hasn't happened for me yet. He said, verse number seven, but while I'm coming, uh, another step of the step of down before me. Uh -huh. So this is, man has done this over and over and over again, probably 38 Eight times. Years. Wow. Man, I just thought, sometimes in my mind, I just think about it when I was reading the story. I just, this story, actually, the more I, mean, the more I think about it, the more it just blows my mind. The, the, just, could you imagine the sheer letdown? of waiting 365 days for one moment. You imagine how it feels when you watch somebody else dip their foot in the pool before you. Right. And think, man, I guess I gotta wait another 365 days. Just not, not necessarily for my healing, but for an opportunity to be healed. I mean, that would be a, that would be a disheartening situation. Yeah. That would be a, 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 a depressing situation. So Jesus, this man testifies, he says, every time I would go to get in the pool, somebody else steps in before me, and then I have to wait another 365 days. Right. Verse 8 says, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Praise the Lord. So, so uh, is this story is a miraculous story of the healing power of a Jehovah who 
send an angel down to trouble the waters. And then the healing power of B, his son Jesus, who can say to a man who's been sick for 38 years, take up your bed and walk. And when you look at this story, you have to say Jesus is a healer. The Father is a healer. God is a healer. But if the truth were told, if you're being theologically honest, you also have to say Jesus didn't heal everybody. Right. One person. Just one? Yeah. Uh, Jesus, how do you make that choice? Well, you've been there a long time. Yeah, but Jesus wasn't there. Other people that were there a long time too. Right. How do you make that choice? Right. And you, could you, could you, you see the theological conundrum. Yeah. The dichotomy. You, 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 you see the, uh, the, the, the difficulty in, in the back. But not only that, you see, uh, I hope you do anyway, uh, where people are at when loved ones die anyway. Right. Okay. Jesus, why did you heal that guy's friend, but not mine? Why did you heal his mom, but not mine? Why did you heal his dad, but not mine? Right. Well, it was it because of me, Jesus? And the modern preacher said, yeah, it was because you, right. you didn't have enough faith, you didn't believe God enough. Right. Oh, and by the way, you didn't give enough money into this ministry. But if you'd have given more money, then God would have done it for you. Uh, and so they just create a pe perpetual cycle of yeah. depression and sadness yeah. where rather than just saying, God has a choice in some matters. Right. I don't understand it all, right. but God has a choice. Yeah. Uh, I ask God to heal, but if he doesn't, I accept it as his choice. Yeah. And I move on. Right. Hard to move on, but I move on nevertheless. Right. And Jesus yeah. would say to us at one point, if your eye offends you and causes you to sin, pluck it out. Yeah. Right, now, I don't think he literally wants us to pluck our eyes out, but what I think in the story that that saying tells us is Jesus is way more concerned about our souls being healed than our bodies right. being healed. Otherwise, yeah. he wouldn't tell me to pluck out my eye, my body. Yeah, so uh, I like it. So, and, and really, uh, I used to think, as a good Pentecostal boy, I used to think that they, they, when, they, when, they, when we were praying for somebody's healing and they would die anyway, uh, and somebody, somebody in the family would say to me, well, now they, they got their healing. Uh, I used to think, man, what a cop. Uh -huh. I used to think that way. Yeah. But God, God, God is good. I mean, we just didn't believe him enough. We didn't pray enough. We didn't shout enough. We didn't speak in tongues enough. We didn't anoint the oil enough. We, didn't, we should have dumped the whole bottle over their head. Yeah. And then they'd have been healed. No, it's not that way all the time. I don't understand why Jesus walks into the pool and heals one man and he's down and come back. But that's what he does. The very fact that he did it is evidence of his mercy. Yeah. If he, he didn't have to heal anybody. All right, let's, let's take a little break real quick at verse number uh, 8. Jesus says, uh, verse number, the scripture in verse number 8, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. So Jesus gives this man a commandment. Now, he's been sick. He's been impotent, uh, <coughs> crippled, essentially, <coughs> helpless, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for, thir <coughs> for 38 years. And Jesus tells him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Now, if you've been, if you've been crippled for 38 years, your legs don't work the way they should, right? I mean, I mean you saw this, right? Uh, and so even even if, even if I started to regain some mobility in my legs, I would have to go to physical therapy to learn how to re-strengthen my legs and to right. re-strengthen my muscles and stuff. But that Jesus doesn't give this man a partial healing of his, of his impotence or of his sickness. Jesus gives him a complete, instantaneous, whole healing. And he just says, rise up and walk. And you haven't done that in 38 years. Yeah. But now you get to praise the Lord. Uh, but the Bible said, verse 9, let's continue to read. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day, was the Sabbath. Now, I would say to you this. Why did Jesus stop by at this time and heal this man? Why? And then why did he heal this man, but not all the other rest? And why did he choose to heal at this time, uh, at this moment in history? And part of the answer is because the same day was the Sabbath. That's part of the answer. Jesus had an agenda. And the Jews in Jerusalem had so perverted the religion of God and the truth of God and the Old Testament of God that they viewed getting up and healing somebody as a on the Sabbath day as a, as a sin. And Jesus was there to pick a fight. Right. Yeah. He was. Yeah. You think Jesus was a sissy boy? <laughs> no, sir. No. <laughs> In fact, he said, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. I came to set people at variance against one another because you got to choose whom you're going to serve and you got to choose to come out of false religion, even yeah. false Judaistic religion, yeah. and get right with God. People are 
our more important Sabbath days. By the way, Jesus came to this town at this moment, in this time, healed this man on the Sabbath day. That was part of his reasoning. But why did he not heal a bunch of them? I mean, he could heal a bunch of them. Right. Right? So part of his reasoning had to be it was the Sabbath day. We're going to find that out in a minute. Verse 10. Uh, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, is, is it the Sabbath day? It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Now God never even said such, uh, such goofy stuff. God didn't tell you you couldn't carry your bed on the Sabbath day. God said it's the Sabbath day. Rest and keep it holy. Which just pretty much implies that you should take a break from your activities. But Jesus uh, over and over and over again to, to teaches us that men, that the Sabbath was not made for man, but man was made for the Sabbath. Excuse me. Excuse me the Sabbath yeah. Vice versa, yeah. the, the Sabbath was made for man. It was a, it was made to give men a rest. It was not made to be some legalistic thing yeah. that says if my car has a flat tire on Sunday, that I can't change it. That's nonsensical. Right. Right. The day was the day. Uh, I wasn't made to serve the day. The day was made to serve me with a moment of rest. Right. And Jesus is picking this fight with them because he knows they have the right that the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem have their heart in the wrong places. We said, Brother Jason, how do you know that? Because when a man who's been sick for 38 years is finally healed, this is their question. He they uh, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. <laughs> Could you imagine that being your response to the healing of somebody who's been sick for 38 years? Yeah. Like that is the worst kind of religious stupidity. Yeah. I mean, it really is. If your religion ever builds that kind of stupidity in you, uh, you, you are doing some things incorrectly. Amen. And the problem is not necessarily if you view some things incorrectly. The problem is when you become the leader of the Jewish religion in Jerusalem and you're telling everybody else to view it incorrectly too. Jesus goes there to pick a fight concerning the Sabbath day and to rebuke them for their uh, wrong beliefs. So, so that's part of uh, the, the situation. It was no accident that Christ's choice was to heal on the Sabbath day. Right. So, what I'm saying to you is this. God, in this particular moment, Christ is in control. He shows up in Jerusalem, not on Friday, but on Saturday. He shows up not on Sunday, but on Saturday. It's the Jewish day, day of rest, the Jewish Sabbath day. That's when he shows up. He heals a man on the Sabbath day. That's part of it, but the truth is he could have healed everybody on the Sabbath day. And he really created a riot in Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What if this man's healing... Now, this is going to blow our minds a little bit. What if this man's healing is more about God's agenda... Than the human agenda. Oh yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Well, why did Jesus choose to heal on the Sabbath day? He made a choice, by the way. Yeah. To heal on the Sabbath day. Why did he show up in Jerusalem on the Sabbath day? Heal on the Sabbath day on purpose. He made a choice. Uh, that was because his choice was going to further the plan of God. The choice was going to give God the Son the opportunity to rebuke Jewish leadership. And that was on the mind of God. It was on the plan of God. Why does God choose to heal one and not another? I don't always know. But I do know this. God has a plan. God has an agenda. God has something he's trying to accomplish. I don't always understand what that something is. But sometimes we view the world as so me-centered that we can't possibly fathom that perhaps God has a reason. Right. Perhaps God has a reason. Yeah. Verse number 11. The Bible said he answered them. Uh, the, the, the cured man, the, the man who was healed by Jesus, he answered them, uh, uh, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Perhaps, let me just throw this out at you, perhaps Jesus knew that this man would have within him the proclivity uh, to, to lay the blame on Jesus uh -huh. instead of stand up for himself. Have you ever been in a situation where you could have easily laid the blame on somebody else, but instead you chose to say, it was, it was me, I made that choice. I don't want to took my own bed up, and who are you to tell me not to take it up anyway? Go mind your own business. <laughs> right. This is America, I'll take my bed up unless God I want to. 
right? Uh, so, so there are certain people that have that proclivity. And by the way, sometimes it's admirable uh, because uh, if I, if I, if I Sometimes, like let's just say someone's working for you uh, and they make a bad decision. I've seen bosses step in and, and they could have easily blamed that bad decision on the worker, but they chose just to eat all of that blame on themselves to save their worker. Now, that doesn't mean they should always do that, but some people are so self sacrificing that rather than just start blame shifting, they'll say, yeah, It was my fault, it was my mistake. I take the heat for that. That's a good boss, by the way, where I come from. Amen. Hey, amen. Uh, but then after the fact, they'll go aside and pull that worker aside and say, hey, this is actually what happened. Uh, and then this the next time, make a different decision to go a different route. Uh, so some people have that kind of self-sacrificing nature. Some people don't. This man didn't. He right away threw blame back to Jesus, which is going to what? Shift the conversation to Jesus, which is what Jesus wanted. So why did Jesus heal this man and not somebody else? Well, he'd been there a long time. Yeah. So would other people. Yeah. But perhaps he, he, he healed this man because this man within him would shift the blame back to the Son of God. And Jesus right. would then have an opportunity to confront them. Uh -huh. The Bible says verse 12, uh, Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? Uh, and he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had uh, conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that Place. Right. Afterward, watch this. Afterward, Jesus finding him, finding him in the temple. Right. And that's interesting. So Jesus heals a man who afterwards, listen to me, who afterwards gives his allegiance back to God. See, Brother Jason, uh, why didn't God heal sometimes? Well, I don't always know, and I wouldn't say this is always the answer. But God knows to some degree, God knows everything. Uh -huh. But in the choice of God, because you think, we sometimes think we're the only ones that have choices. In the choice of God, God knew that this man would go back to the temple. In the choice of Christ, God knew that this man would be somebody who, after being healed, wouldn't go back out and smoke and drink and cuss. He wouldn't be like the guy who gets a liver transplant because he drank too much beer with his lifetime. And now the doctor who gives him a liver transplant says, listen, don't trash this liver the same way you trash the last one. Right? Right? Yeah. And yet he goes back out and gets drunk, crashes the next lever anyway, and just lives his life as a sob drunk. But we as human beings, we cannot see what people are going to do with the new liver. We can't look into the future, but God knows the future. God knows whether I'm going back to the temple or going back to the bottle. So sometimes that may be in the choice of God. I don't know. That's not always the case, though, because sometimes there are good Christian people that would have been, if they'd have been healed, they'd have continued to serve God in the temple, then they didn't get healed. So it's not always the choice. It's not always the, mad, the, 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 the fact of the matter. But I guess this is what I'm trying to get you to see that, oh boy, we're, we're running out of time. This is what I'm trying to get you to see that this, this, the subject of the healing of the body is so complex that you and I and the American church is wrong to put it all in a tiny little box and say, if they didn't get healed, sis, it's because you didn't pray enough and you didn't give enough money and you didn't give enough this and you weren't dedicated to God enough. When the subject of who gets healed and who doesn't is too complex to put it all in a tight little box. Amen. we got to think about these things. Verse number 14, we're going to, we're going to finish this story. Now, if you're, ready, if you're ready to go home, feel free to be dismissed. But I'm going to keep going. As long as there's one person sitting in the pew, I'm talking to them. <laughs> Verse 14. Amen. Verse 14 says, Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art, behold, thou art made whole. Watch what he says to him. Sin no more. Now, this is an interesting statement. Lest the worst thing come upon thee. Now, the average American television evangelist not only tells people that they're not healed or they didn't get healed because of they, don't, they didn't have enough faith, but he also tells them sometimes that they didn't get healed because they have sin in their life. Right. But the truth is, the biggest sinner of the crowd is the televangelist, televangelist right. most of the time. Uh, Amen. Yeah. So, uh, what is Jesus saying here? Now, I guess I would caution you this way. You should never take any statement that's in the Bible, unless the Bible specifically leads you to, you should never take any statement and make a blanket statement that is the reality all the time. 
So Jesus does seem to indicate that this man became sick. He does seem to indicate it, not necessarily, but this man became sick. It seems to be the indication because of sin. Right? Because Jesus, no the Jesus' first words to him after the healing is, sin no more. So stop sinning. And what does Jesus say? Lest the worst thing come upon me. You know, sometimes our sin does have the consequences of sickness. It does. You smoke 75 packs of cigarettes a day, and guess what? You're destroying your lungs. And your sin is creating your sickness. Amen. 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 You see, you drink 57 beers every night before bed, and your sin is creating your uh, sickness. Uh, and it may be your sin that has led you to sickness, but or has led the sickness to you. But this is also true. While it is true that sin has consequences and sin can be the cause of sickness, it is not true that sin is always the cause of sickness. That's right. That's right. So that, that distinction has to be made. And that's true. Right. In fact, if we had time, I'd flip over to John 9 and I would show you the story where the disciples asked Jesus, who, why is this man sick? Did, his, did he sin or did his mom and dad sin? And Jesus said, nobody sinned. This man's not sick because of sin. Right. So sometimes people might get sick because of sin. Right. But other right. times they may not. Right. Well, here's an example. Do you remember Paul's teaching uh, on the Lord's Supper? Yeah. He said, if you eat or drink of this cup unworthily, you eat or drink damnation to yourself. And he said, some and many are sick and weakly, I believe is the term he used. And he said, some have even fallen asleep because of the, their misuse of the Lord's Supper. So their sin and misusing the Lord's Supper brought sickness and damn, even death into their lives. So I would say to you, don't misuse the Lord's Supper. Right, man. Right? Yeah. But if I get sick tomorrow, is it because I sinned? Yeah. No, not necessarily. Right? right? Not necessarily. Right. Uh, but Jesus does seem to equate this man's sickness with his sin. Because he's telling him, go sin no more. Yeah. Uh, the implication is that sin has consequences. And if you, sin, if you keep sinning, maybe a worse thing is going to come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Isn't that funny? Yeah. To some degree, Jesus knew that this man would tell the Jews that Jesus was the one that made him whole. Right. Jesus healed this man on purpose. That's right. Yes. But did he heal every man? No. No. Just one. Just one. He made a choice. Uh, let's, uh, let's let's continue on, uh, and, and, and I'm gonna read just a few more verses, and then we're gonna we're gonna they're gonna be dismissed, I guess. Even though there's a lot more I want to say. <laughs> Amen. Verse 15. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Jesus knew what he was doing. Yes, he, he healed a man on the Sabbath on purpose. Well, why didn't he heal somebody on Friday? Because it wasn't the Sabbath day. Partially. Oh, well, he knew what he was doing in so much that he knew who the man was and he knew the man would shift the blame back to Jesus, but he also knew the man would go to the temple and have a chance to serve God with his life. Uh, he also knew that he'd have a chance to tell the man, don't sin anymore, go and sin no more. And so he knew that the man would relay the message that it was Jesus who had healed him, which would create the controversy between Jesus and the Jews. Verse 17, but Jesus answered uh, them, Jesus answered okay. the Jews, My father worked hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only had uh, because he had because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said or that but said all but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus heals the man for a lot of, of his own particular reason. Right. At the end of the day. The reality is this. Jesus doesn't heal everybody. Right. God doesn't heal everybody. No. If he did, none of us would ever die. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Right. So, if you pray for somebody who's sick and they get healed, thank God for their healing. Yeah, that's right. yeah. It's not your power. You didn't work your Pentecostal self up enough to do it. No. You're nothing special. Jesus is something special. Yeah, that's right. Give the glory back to God. Yes. Amen. And don't yes. think you prayed enough to merit the healing because you can't pray enough to merit healing. Right. 
But if you pray for somebody and they don't get healed, right. you don't beat yourself up and think that it's all your fault. And That's if right. you prayed for your parents to get healed and they passed away anyway, you do, don't sit around and beat yourself up and tell yourself, oh, I was a better Christian and I did more. And I believe God more like, the, the, like Smith Wigglesworth and all this other stories from a bygone generation ago. Hey, you don't sit around and beat yourself up. Guess what you do? You re Here's what you do. This is the only soft pillow when people don't get healed. You rest in the sovereignty of God. That's right. Yeah. That is the only soft pillow to lay my head on yeah. when I pray for somebody desperately to be healed and they don't get healed. The only soft pillow is it's not my fault and God is not bad. God has made a choice and I rest in his choice. Uh, I rest in his decision. Yeah. Uh, and I, they have received their ultimate healing. That is not a cop out. That is true. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. That is true. You rest in God's sovereignty. Yeah. And your faith can never be worked up enough to force God to make a decision that he does not want to make. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. God has a choice. Right. Yes, he right. does. But just, we, always, always have to remember, no matter the outcome, Amen. we always have to remember Scripture tells us that the fervent prayer of a righteous man is much. Amen. To what, to what point was that? We won't know until we get home, I guess, and yeah. we'll know all everything. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. That's right. And that, 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 that's the truth, isn't it? Yeah. When we get there, we'll see it all. Oh, that's right. Amen. Why Jesus heals one and not another, I don't yeah. know. But when I get there, I'll understand. We'll understand. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Go ahead. Um, so you and I briefly talked tonight about a little bit of this uh, lesson tonight. And I had, it, it brought up the conversation of my dad. <coughs> and I'm going to try to get through this without... So, um, you know, we, I told you, you asked if it was a tough topic, and I told you no, that it was actually a good topic, because it helps me. Because one of the things I struggled with was doubting what I did for my dad as a Christian, and if I prayed for him enough. Um, and I told you, I said, well, you know, the, the thing that pulls me back and gets me level-headed again is knowing that at the end of it, I could have prayed for him every day, 10 times a day, for the last year of his life when the doctors called, us, called me in and told me that he had six months to a year to live. If I would have spent every single day praying 10 to 20 times a day, chances are my dad was still going to die. Could God have healed him? Yes. Um, but so I think this, this helps me to not beat myself up so much. Right. Um, because you do hear so often, if only you had more faith. Right. Uh -huh. uh, because I did, you know, you get to that point to where you say, okay, well, this is just, this is where he's at, and this is how it's going to go. And, you know, maybe I, maybe I did back off praying, but it's still, at the end of the day, I have to know that this was the path for my dad. Um, and it, he had dementia. And the doctors said it's rare for someone at his age to so quickly just go into fourth stage dementia, stage four dementia. Um, he died at 68 years old, and it happened within nine months after he, the doctors told us he has dementia, he has six to 12 months to live. Nine months, my dad was gone. And I don't think it was God's fault. It's not, I mean, there, there are things that we do in our lives that bring on sickness sometimes, like you just said. It's, you know, my dad was a fighter. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard about blows, serious blows my dad has taken to the head. He owned his own business and he was working on the top of St. Joe Hospital and fell. And that caused back and brain injury at that time. So all the years that my dad, by choice, was going out partying and fighting and hitting, getting hit in the head, the doctors told me that that led to the early onset dementia. Because your brain, your, you can only take so many hits to the head without it causing that, those sort of things. So you know, even if God would have healed my dad, I, I mean, he was an old man, so I doubt he would have been out partying and fighting. <laughs> but who knows, I guess. Right. But even if he would have healed him, would it have made a positive, I mean, yeah, maybe a positive difference. But also, it could have also 
made him have another 10 years of suffering in a different way. That's right. You're I right. mean, I don't know that, but God does. Yeah. That's right. And, you know, I didn't think of it this way until I was listening to you. My dad sat in his house for three months because he did with her. Yeah. And it is a lot like dementia because his body quit working. And for three months he laid in his house not able to stand up, not able to walk. And he called me one day and said, you will never believe what just happened. And I said, what? He said, I just ran through the living room. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, I just ran. He said, I just got up and I just ran. Uh -huh. And I said, well, do you know what that is? He said, that's God. <coughs> it's got to be God. Yeah. That was my dad's word. And I forgot yeah. about that until I listened to you. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, I just didn't think about it. But maybe that day, God gave him the ability to stand up on his legs so that he could say, it was God. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's good. That's the mercy of God. And that's yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. A gentle reminder. Yeah. yeah. Amen.